Hey everyone, this is Leanne from Of Love and Chip Lap and the founder of Sub That Tutorials and More. Please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you never miss out on any of our new videos and check the video description for a link to the new Sub That US mobile learning library app. You can access all of our free tutorials neatly organized for you and subscribe for the premium access plan to gain access to all of our exclusive content and communities, including the Affinity Masterclasses. Today's tutorial is one that I'm a little embarrassed I haven't done sooner. It is on sublimation whiskey or uh, double old fashioned or low ball glasses. I have had these glasses for years, both clear ones and frosted ones, and I just haven't done a tutorial on them for some reason. I've gifted them a few times, but this was, you know, the first time I've really taken time to go over them. If you've been following for a while, then you know that I absolutely love Scotch whiskey glasses. This is an item that I used to sell successfully etched as just like the glass with a basic monogram etching and using vinyl stencil and etching cream. It was a super popular item that I carried in my Etsy shop many years ago that exploded overnight. And really that was kind of the end of the story. Like business just took off completely unexpectedly. And it was one of the best feelings. And it really just came down to offering this particular item in a personalized manner that was more curated and less just trying to print anything and everything. So I have a lot of like fun little tips in regards to how to best market these, which is part of the marketing video for this in our exclusive subscriber library where we talk about product marketing. Be sure to check that out if you are a subscriber and if you're not, subscribe so you can learn more. So I am going to be doing these frosted ones from Single J's Sublimation today. I'm pretty sure I bought these on a buy-in, but they are still available for, from her. And we're doing this like fun map design. The design tutorial itself is one of our subscriber exclusives as well. So be sure to check that out. But you can really do anything that you want. The main focus of this tutorial is going to be how to sublimate these with a full wrap design. So a full wrap design, we're going to want to use our convection toaster oven for simply because the glass does have a slight taper. So we're going to want to use shrink wrap to get the best results. And when you're doing glass in a mug press, it doesn't get the same kind of like even temperature when you rotate it that we see with stainless steel tumblers. So set yourself up for success. This is gonna be a product that we use our convection oven for. The cost of production on these is gonna be anywhere between $5 and $7.50, depending on where you happen to purchase these, if there's a sale, all of those things. You can retail these for $20 for one, but I recommend selling two for 45 and including shipping. Shipping will cost you around $9 for most of the United States, and the most it should cost you is, I think, $14 is the medium flat rate box pricing right now for USPS. That would be like the maximum you would pay. This is one of my little tricks if you haven't seen my video on how to navigate free and discounted shipping. In that video, I talk about factoring in the size box that you can ship something in. And so you can create a set that fits inside of a box so that you always know the maximum you'll pay for shipping anywhere in the United States. I can tell you from experience that usually the shipping is less than that medium flat rate box was, but when you know that that's the maximum, it allows you to set your pricing accordingly. So I think that this is the perfect kind of product for individual sales, wholesale, and then of course, doing something that's extra personalized that you can sell as a set of two or even a set of four. It makes a great gift for pretty much all year round, birthdays, milestones, Christmas, um, anniversaries, Valentine's Day, and so on. So let's go ahead and start by getting our measurements. We'll set up our Design and Affinity Designer. We're going to be leveraging the new live warp function that's in Affinity Designer 2.0. If you don't have Affinity Designer 2.0, but you have Affinity Photo 1, you can use the same filter effect there. I have pre done a previous video on our, we did glasses then too, it was the sunflower glasses. In that tutorial, I also used the Affinity Photo because that was before Affinity Photo 
or Affinity Designer 2.0 came out. So I used Affinity Photo 1 with the warp tool for that. So I'll link that video so that you can refer back to that if you just want to see it. It's the same steps. But if you have Affinity Designer 2.0, we can use the new live mesh warp function to customize this so that it'll wrap seamlessly all around and you're going to have a perfect fit every single time. Let's turn around and get those measurements and then we'll head over to the computer. Here is a look at our frosted lowball glass for sublimation from Single J's. Uh, it is 10, 10 and a half ounces, which is usually referred to as a double old fashioned glass. And as you can see, it's fully frosted, which allows you to print on the entire thing. Now you can always do just one piece designs or do full bleed, it's totally up to you. I feel like context of the design is ultimately what matters when you make that decision. As someone who successfully sold Scotch whiskey glasses for a few years, I found that anything that is monogrammed or somewhat personal sold so much better than something that wasn't. Simply because this is the kind of item that stands alone as a great gift. And you can do them in sets of two, which is how I recommend selling them. Uh, but you can always offer one as well. I feel like two allows you to finagle the price point a little bit and get a little bit more profit, especially when you factor in shipping. You could also do up to four. I've done both options. So any type of personalization is really good for this. And I would opt for that over something really generic. If you're looking for a middle ground, I would say the focus is going to be on area specific types of things. So if you want something that's not personalized, but also not just any random design, think about what's important in your area and cater to your audience accordingly. That also opens up the avenue to create wholesale ordering for local gift shops and things like that. Like, And of course, we're not just talking about local to you, but if you are selling in a wholesale capacity where you are focused on catering to gift shops anywhere, if they see something that they're like, oh yeah, I love how that's personalized for this town. We have this iconic monument, flower, tree, whatever, that is our town. We love stuff like that. Here in Fayetteville, North Carolina, something we see a lot of is the dogwood flower. The dogwood flower, I'm pretty sure, is the flower of North Carolina, although maybe it's the azalea. I actually don't know what the flower of North Carolina is. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but I do know that we have dogwood things, dogwood flowers on all of the things here. So you can go into almost any gift shop and find something with a dogwood flower on it that is representative of Fayetteville. Also, because we're a military town, there's a lot of military focused ideas. Um, there's a lot of you know, North Carolina's my temporary home type of ideas, because all of those cater to the local demographic. And that same concept can be applied literally anywhere. So when you're offering this, you have some flexibility in the ideas that you put forth. But the uniqueness of your idea and catering to something that is personalized, something that is unique, is what's going to allow you to get the best profit off of these. And that, of course, is the ultimate goal. We don't want to continue the practice of just printing any design on any product. That's not a good business strategy. Most people are starting to realize that. And my goal is to just keep educating you guys on the best ways to market and sell your products so that you can absolutely make the most money and really grow your businesses. So as always, our first step is going to be to get the measurements. Now, I've seen these advertised on a couple of different websites, and all of them will say slightly tapered. They are in fact slightly tapered. It's not a huge difference, but it's enough that it's worth measuring and um, configuring or warping your design accordingly if you're doing something that's full bleed. If you're doing a design that's just like in this space, you don't have to worry about it. But we're doing a full bleed design today. And with that in mind, I wanna get my measurements and make sure that we size everything accordingly. So we are gonna need our uh, top circumference, our bottom circumference, and our height in order to make sure our template is set up accordingly. I do have a free template for you guys that fits these glasses, but it's always good practice to actually measure. So let's go ahead and get that started. We are going to wrap around the top. Using a fabric tape measure is the best way to do this, and you wanna make sure you're right at that top edge and 
rub your finger along to make sure everything is flush. So when we do that, I'm getting nine and seven eighths for my top circumference. And then same thing on the bottom. Once again, making sure that top end of your tape measure is on the, the top. All right, and then we're getting, looks like we're getting right at nine and one eighth for our bottom diameter, or bottom circumference, sorry. You can always do diameter, but I find circumference to be more accurate, so I prefer to go that route. And then we're gonna do our height. I always like to move right in at the one and put the one on the line and then measure down. So it looks like we are at three and five eighths, but there's a small lip at the top. Mm, it feels like there's a little bit one at the bottom. So I always like to decrease and just make sure that I'm getting the best coverage. So if we go with three and a half, that's not bad. I think three and a quarter is actually gonna be better suited. So if we look at that three and a quarter, I feel like we're gonna get a nice good full bleed design without sacrificing anything, but, with all, but also setting ourselves up for success by not getting too close to these edges with their little bit of a ridge to them where our design might not transfer smoothly. So that's just a little thing to keep in mind as you're feeling out substrates and getting those measurements. So we're gonna go with three and a quarter. So the next thing we wanna do is set up our design in Affinity Designer. And I'm gonna go ahead and pop over to the computer, show you how that is done, and then we'll get this printed and baked in our convection toaster oven. If you have not created your design that you plan on printing on your Scotch whiskey glass, you are gonna to wanna to go ahead and do that first. So really quickly, what you'll do is come to File, New, or New Document, and you're going to enter in the measurements of the Scotch Whiskey glass that we measured. So ours was 9.9 .9 and 7 eighths, which is 9.875. And then our height was three and a half, but we're gonna make our design three and a quarter just to make sure that we um, accommodate those little ridges at the top and the bottom without issue. So that sets my page height to 3.25 inches. If you operate in centimeters or millimeters, you can adjust those document units right here. Make sure your DPI is set to 300. Do not have create artboard checkmarked. And your color format should be as it shows on screen whenever you are creating a design. This is the settings that you always use. If you're using Affinity Designer 1.0, your document setup panel is laid out a little bit differently, but all of these options are still there. So once you're ready, you can click Create. Now you can design to your heart's content whatever you would like on here. Use digital papers, add clip art elements, add text. The sky is the limit. We have ample tutorials on how to use Affinity Designer for different types of projects as well as our master classes. So be sure to check those out so that you can leverage all of the tools to create the whiskey glass design of your dreams. Now I've already created my design. That was a completely separate subscriber exclusive tutorial. So if you are a subscriber and wanna make the map glass design, be sure to check that out. Once you have your design created, you want to export that PNG by coming to file and export. Keep in mind that this does not save the file to that you're working on. So if you wanna be able to come back and work on it again, you need to do file and save as to save the affinity format file with your layers. But for the part that you're gonna bring in for the template, you're gonna to come to file and export, select PNG, whole document, click export. It will open your file explorer and you can then save your design. I have already done that. Your next step is going to be to open up the templates that I have created. You can also use the template to design in if you want to. So you do have two options here. The reason why I don't initially recommend just opening the template and designing in the template is because the template is designed for warping. Um, the Affinity Designer 
version two template will automatically warp your PNG layer for you. So you need to have your completed PNG rectangle design first. The version one template is just a curve and you could choose to create inside of that template. But again, because the glass is slightly tapered, it's best to create your design separate, then bring it into uh, the template itself and clip it and adjust it how you need. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, it's a little bit different to use templates that are designed for the purpose of warping for something that's tapered. Again, you can absolutely design in them if you want, but they're not automatically going to taper. That might impact the flow of your design when it's printed. You do what you're comfortable with, but I've provided free templates to the Scotch Whiskey glasses in the video description. Go ahead and download those. You're going to save them into your templates folder. Your templates folder is wherever you have created it on your computer. I recommend saving it in some type of a cloud drive like OneDrive, iCloud, Google Drive, Dropbox, etc. You can see right here mine is saved into OneDrive. So anytime I create a template for you guys, I end up saving it into my Affinity Templates folder. My folder is available within Affinity. All I have to do to add a folder is click this little plus sign to add a folder and select your folder from your file explorer and then it will forever appear here and everything you put in that folder is going to appear as well. So when I open my Affinity Templates folder, I have all these different templates which I have created for different purposes. So let's just talk quickly about the Affinity um, template for version one. So in version one, all you have here is a curve. You can get rid of the color on this curve if you want. As I said, you can choose to add your design in here and just have everything clipped into this layer. You can also choose to import your design and resize it. There's no ability to warp your design to match this shape in Affinity Designer 1.0. However, you can choose to come to File and then edit in photo and open up Affinity Photo 1.0 and you can use the mesh warp function there to adjust it. Affinity Designer 2.0 does have the uh, roster or pixel based warp function in the pixel persona. If you wanna see it in action in Affinity Photo, I have linked a relevant tutorial of when I did pint glasses with um, sunflowers where I did actually cover exporting this to Affinity Photo 1.0 and doing that. So be sure to just review that if you're looking for that function. It's gonna be the same steps technically. <laughs> so I'll import a graphic just to show you really quick. So I'm gonna select my place image tool. I'm gonna to choose my graphic. I'm going to drop it in when I see that puddle with the downward arrow. I wanna make sure it's resized fully. I'm gonna line it up in the middle of my template. There we go. So we got that red line across the middle. That's where we wanna be. You are going to clip this inside or you can simply manipulate it from the top layer or move your curve layer to the top by dragging it. So if you do this, you're gonna to want to obviously remove the fill. I would just swap this little arrow up here at the top so that the stroke is filled. So whether you do this in Affinity Photo or you do it in, um, or if you're trying to manually do it with the live, the live, filter in Affinity Designer 2.0, it's the same thing. In Affinity Designer, you'll come to the pixel persona. In Affinity Photo, it will already exist. You're going to come to wherever the warp tools are. In this case, we find it by going to Layer and choosing New Live Filter and then choosing Mesh Warp. You'll then get these nodes and we're gonna match everything to our blue outline. So I'm gonna bring this node down, snap it right there. I'm gonna bring this node in, snap it right there. I wanna straighten out these little handlebars so that my design 
lines up perfectly with my curve. Do the same thing on the other side. I recommend doing your corner nodes first and straightening out those side lines first or second, I guess. And then you will simply come to the middle. And if you're not sure if you have the middle or not, grab a guideline from your ruler on the side. You can just click and drag on that ruler, drag it till you get that green, and then come back to your warp here. If you just double click on the grid, it'll pop back open. And then just drag that line right up in the middle and right up in the middle at the bottom. And just like that, you've totally warped your design. You can click done. Again, this is done in Affinity Photo 1.0 if you have that but only have Affinity Designer 1.0 as well. This is what you can follow in 2.0 if you don't want to use the 2.0 template. The 2.0 template, I've already done the work for you. So um, this, if you have done this method, whether you've done it in Affinity Photo or done it over here, if you've used the live work function, you do have to rasterize before you print. So right click on that and select rasterize and now it'll be ready to print. You can just get rid of that blue outline and you're good to go. So this is the Affinity Designer 1.0 template, just to be clear. If you have Affinity Designer 2.0, I did show the 2.0 live function, just to clarify again. Affinity Designer 1.0 does not have any warp functions of any type. Affinity 2.0 does. But if you have version two, you will open up the, the version two template, you'll select it, select create, you will come to, oh, that's okay. You will come to this group layer. You're gonna select where it says design layer and you're gonna choose replace image. You're going to select your image that you created. And then all you have to do is right click and rasterize and you're ready to go. You are ready to print. This is set up on letter size by default because that is the page size that's smallest that you would end up printing on for sublimation. Now you can actually print two of these designs on here um, if you wanted to, so that's an option as well. Now that we are actually ready to print, my recommendation is to always set your page up the same way your printer feeds the paper. And the reason why I recommend this is because a lot of times people get tripped up and like their printer settings, they miss something when they have their page laid out in landscape like this, but their printer prints portrait, which most of them do. I'm gonna be using the Epson SureColor F570 Pro today with letter size paper into the auto sheet feeder. So therefore, I need to rotate my page. When you select the document itself, you don't have any layers selected, you can choose document setup. And all I'm gonna do is check mark this box that says portrait. You can double check your color panel to make sure you're set up with the appropriate settings for sublimation and then click OK. Then I will select my design and my option to rotate counterclockwise right up there. If I wanted to print two of them, I could move it over and duplicate, but I only need one today, so I will set it up like this. Just like that, we are ready to print. We're gonna come to File, Print. You will select your printer from your drop-down menu you will then select properties, and if you have any settings that you need to adjust or select, you will do all of that. This is what the printer properties settings looks like for the SureColor F500 series printers. Um, I wanna make sure that I have auto sheet feeder selected. I wanna make sure that the paper size or paper type is sent to rigid because we are doing a hard substrate. Uh, normally simple settings is checkmarked and you could just choose print with high quality. I'm not sure why that was deselected, to be honest. Uh, also, if you want a print preview, you can check mark that as well. Your printer properties box might look a little bit different. Go ahead and the main thing you wanna focus on is that your paper settings are correct. If you have to choose a special paper type, you wanna choose that as well. Because I'm using a sublimation ready printer, I literally don't have to do anything other than select file, print, 
make sure my paper size is correct and I'm good to go. That's one of the things that I absolutely love about the Epson SureColor F570 Pro. The entire user experience is very seamless. So coming from the Workforce 7710, I loved that printer. It served me well, um, but I don't ever have to do anything extra with this printer and it's flawless every time. So we'll go ahead and click OK and then OK again and it will send our transfer off to print. Once your transfer is printed, go ahead and cut it out. Now the nice part about doing a full bleed design like this is that you do have a little bit of a background to guide you in terms of your cutting. Now because I'm doing this street design, the background is pretty subtle and honestly this is barely going to transfer, but that's okay. It did make cutting this out a bit easier. For the end, because this is just a white space, I just cut it however. I didn't really consume myself with anything there. Now, some people might think, oh, well, why don't we just put an outline border on what we need to cut out? You can absolutely do that. In my experience, one of the problems with putting a border on anything that you print for sublimation is that you might think that you have trimmed off that little, that little edge, but you might not have. And if there is any tiny little molecule of that black or whatever color edge you make hiding along the edge of your design, it will transfer. I think most people have experienced something like this before. You literally cannot see it on the paper. It'll be the, the tiniest, tiniest little bit. Maybe it was like along the edge that your paper caught as it was being fed through the printer, whatever it was, and it transfers and it totally ruins the substrate and it's so frustrating. My goal is to always make sure you guys are set up for the most success, the least amount of product waste, the most success, the most seamless process. So with that in mind, don't do an outline in my opinion and do a nice filled design so that you can have a little bit of a guidance on what to cut. So we're gonna go ahead and wrap this around our glass. And assuming we've done everything correctly, it should match right up. I wanna make sure I'm centering it good. Fantastic. So just kind of eyeball it and make sure that your space from edge to edge looks pretty even. And before I tape, I always like to look inside and just make sure everything looks good. Also, it's good to make sure that you've actually put things right side up, but you can get a good look at how this looks. If you're doing a full bleed design that doesn't have a space like mine does, you can use this to make sure that you've lined up whatever needs to be lined up at that center seam perfectly as well. So once we are sure that we have this exactly the way we want it, I kind of need to look past the iPad here. All right, mine looks pretty good. So we are going to, what I like to do is hold your finger on one flap and then really give this a good tug to make sure it's nice and tight on the other. It's also helpful to run your hand around it and make sure you don't feel any gaps or air bubbles between your paper and your substrate. And then hold that down with your thumb and apply a little heat tape. And then I always like to do another quick feel around to make sure there's no air bubbles. I would rather find an air bubble, adjust the tape, reprint the transfer if I have to, than risk uh, wasting a whole substrate when I don't have to. Now we're gonna need some shrink wrap because I am doing this in the convection toaster oven. I do recommend this method if you're doing the full wrap around. If you are just doing a design right in here, you can use a mug press and I will plan on doing a separate tutorial at a later date on that option. I am using, I believe this is for like the fatty sublimation tumblers they're usually called. They're like the wider ones. It's not the 20 ounce, it is bigger than that. So ones that are wider. I went through the different types of shrink wrap that I have and the one for skinny tumblers was not quite big enough to go down this, much to my surprise. And I had like some for 15 ounce, like 15 ounce like kids things. That didn't work either. I think that shrink wrap that's made for coffee mugs would work really well or this. I bought this for something and it didn't fit, but I had some sheets left over and it's perfect for this. So what we're gonna do is just cut it in half because we don't need to waste this entire thing for one. We only need half of this. And 
and we'll slide our glass on in and then we're going to sh uh, shrink it with our low heat heat gun. Mine is right back there. I always keep it plugged in behind my whole workbench. Now, whenever I do any type of glass item or any drinkware item, I like to heat the top you heat the bottom and then heat the middle. That way we can make sure that this has shrunk around really nice and tight before we shrink the middle. If you shrink the middle first, you're gonna end up shrinking this up. That's not what we want. Now we're certainly not trying to win any awards with how we do our shrink wrap, but this is your last opportunity per se to double check, especially around your edges, to make sure you don't have any air gaps. And I recommend this with all drinkware items that you do shrink wrap on. Make sure that you don't feel any little bubbles. Usually you would see little ripples in your paper. Um, look for that because again, far more worth it to scrap a transfer or shrink wrap and a few pieces of tape, then waste an entire substrate. Set yourself up for success by due diligence throughout the prepping process before you put something in to sublimate. So the way that we wanna do this, and I did try doing this a few different methods, because the bottom of this glass is so thick, it is gonna take longer to absorb the heat, and this is gonna impact the transfer. So I found that the best way to do these is to put them uh, straight up and down, you know, the heavy bottom here, for nine minutes and then flip for four minutes. So you're gonna do 13 minutes total. We're doing this at 400 degrees in the convection oven. The reason why we're gonna start with this on the bottom is because all of these toaster ovens heat from the bottom. They heat from the bottom and then the convection setting is basically just like a fan inside that's circulating the air. So we want to make sure that this is getting warmed up first and getting all of that heat in there so we can get a nice clean transfer on this lower portion and then we can flip it over and just finish it off. And that is perfect. So let's go ahead and pop this in our convection oven. As I said, we've got 400 degrees. We're gonna do nine minutes for uh, with it straight up and down, and then we'll flip it over for the remaining four. Our glass is officially cooled completely down. Now I prefer to let them cool completely before peeling them as much as possible, or at least until they're like lukewarm. Um, that usually takes a good 20, 25 minutes. What I wanna show you guys before I peel it is if you look inside our design, you will notice that it looks more bold than it did at the beginning when we were just applying our transfer. Anytime you're doing an item that is glass, this little trick is a great way to gauge if it's actually ready to come out of the oven or not. So if you pull it out and you think it's ready, but you're not sure and you look and it doesn't look like your transfer has this nice bold look, it's not ready. Put it in there for another minute or so. Um, I use this trick all the time when I do something I haven't ever done before because I obviously want to make sure it's successful and it's just a great gauge. So let's go ahead and peel that. I do notice that anytime I do glassware, I end up with shrink wrap on the top, which kind of annoys me. Um, it tends to stick a little bit, and I find that you can easily peel it off with your fingernail, or if you don't have fingernails, you can use something like a box cutter 
and just kind of lightly bring it on the edge. So I'm just doing this over the garbage can off the camera because I don't want little pieces of shrink wrap everywhere. <laughs> All right, there we go. I got my last little piece off of that, and then you can just continue to peel the rest of it. I usually try and have a garbage can nearby because sometimes shrink wrap peels off wonderfully in one piece. Other times it breaks into a million little pieces. And, you know, we wanna have something to throw it away in. There we go, bottom part's right off, and... Our paper peeled here. My goodness, static cling is real today. Everything is sticking to me. Okay, so there is a look at our glass. Oh my gosh, it looks amazing. I am super excited about this. This is a project I've wanted to do for a while and making this for someone special for their birthday was such a fantastic idea. I actually made two of them. We have this one. And then the one that I tested, I did two different locations. So we've got two different sets of coordinates and little hearts where the important place is. So these are a fantastic gift idea, fantastic item to personalize, and you can really personalize them a million different ways. So there you have it. Be sure to check out the other videos related to this series and my recommendations for how to market this product for your handmade business. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great rest of your day.